Welcome to an introduction to accounting brought to you by Parkbench Tutors and narrated by David Hobcroft. You can find us on Facebook. Just look for Parkbench Tutors. We're going to look at the first ideas of cost accounting. Financial accounting is what you've probably studied so far, where mostly it's historical costs. In other words, we look at details of the cost after the event. So then they are related to the total costs rather than to each unit of production. So there are two important points there. Financial accounting deals with historical costs and they don't relate the costs to each unit of production, which means that you can't relate costs and revenues to managers or departments. And if you can't relate them to managers or departments, you can't really relate profit to the units of production. Now in contrast, cost accounting takes a different approach. Cost accounting determines costs and profits during a period. It's used for preparation of budgets. It's used to make forecasts for a period. We use cost accounting to create reporting systems to provide information so we can take decisions. And it's important to note we can use cost accounting in service industries. It's not just manufacturing industry. In order to use cost accounting, we have to identify two things, cost units and cost centers. So we need to know what these are. A cost unit is any unit of production or a unit of service where you can determine the costs. So it's useful then for manufacturing and for servicing industries. Let's take cost units. If Ford Motor Company wants to deal in cost units, then its cost unit might be a particular model of a car or a van or a truck, but it wouldn't be just cars or vans or trucks or vehicles. You'd have to be a little more specific. Similarly, an appliance manufacturer could relate costs to a particular washing machine, tumble dryer, fri refrigerator, freezer, or so on. In other words, our cost unit has to be a specific item for manufacturing. For a service industry, it's perhaps not qu quite as easy to see, but let's take a solicitor and a look at, say, conveyancing costs, and you can relate conveyancing costs to the hours that any particular person in the office has spent on the task. So you can have a cost per hour of charge time. Education could be the cost related to each student re enrolled or for students enrolled on particular courses. In fact, education is a field where very little costing is done and would certainly benefit from cost accounting. You need to take care in actually picking out what your cost unit is. Let's take everything as extra airlines, managed I believe by an Irishman, and that's looking at costs for carrying passengers to an airport in Lithuania. So we have three routes, Airport A, Airport B and Airport C all go to the same airport in Lithuania. So we could use the cost per passenger, but this would be a weakness, this wouldn't be the best measurement, because the distance from each airport would be different. So what we need to do is relate it to miles and to passengers. So what can we have as a better measurement? We could have the cost of carrying a passenger one mile on each route. And that means we have a level field for the measurement of costs. What about a cost centre? What do we mean by a cost centre? Well, this is an area where the costs can be determined and related. It's sometimes easy to do in a factory, not quite as easy to do in some other situations. So where the total costs are known, then part of the process of cost accounting is to allocate costs to cost centres. So we have a cost centre for a garage carrying out servicing on motor vehicles and we want to allocate costs. We can allocate costs to the stores department, allocate them to office administration and allocate them to service activities. And each of those centres will have a manager who is responsible for the control of costs. So cost accounting provides information for managers and managers can also be held accountable for the costs in their cost centre. How many cost centres do we want? Well, it depends how easy it is to measure a cost centre. Normally we would say that an assembly line is a cost centre, but with more and more automation it may well be possible to break down that assembly line into different areas, engine fitting, body fishing, fitting, paint spraying and so on. What we actually choose depends on why we need the information and what sort of quality of information do we require. So what are the costs that we're trying to measure? 
We want to measure the cost of materials, the cost of labour, and the cost of overhead such as maintenance of the premises. We want to measure indirect costs such as administration and sales. We want to measure direct costs for the cost unit, right? These are the costs that we can attribute directly to those cost units. So, Nora Nobles produces garden sheds. What are her direct costs? She has materials, timber, glass, fittings and so on to make the shed. She also has labour that's employed solely for the purpose of assembling and constructing the shed. And she has some direct expenses associated with the purchase of materials to make the shed. But she also has indirect costs, and her indirect costs include office expenses, marketing and selling expenses, distribution expenses. You can apply the same idea to a service industry. Collie Wobbles has a bed and breakfast, and we've identified these costs. Her direct costs, laundry for bedding, cleaning of rooms, cost of food for the breakfasts, and cost of preparing and cooking that food. And her indirect costs include advertising and the maintenance of the premises. So that's not a complete list, you may well be able to think of more. But it's a good idea of what we mean by direct and indirect costs. That ends our simple introduction to costing, brought to you by Parkbench Tutors, narrated by David Hopcroft. Thank you for watching and for listening. We wish you success in your studies. Parkbench Tutors. Find us on Facebook or look us up on the internet. Parkbench Tutors dot com.